But don't take my word for it. Check out the stats. Well, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Jorge Perkovich. I'm the CEO for, for Havas in Latin America. First of all, let me introduce the, the panel, and uh, thank you for participating today. Uh, Ernesto Echevarria, he's the Director of Marketing for Latam Airlines, uh, based here in Miami. Uh, Travis Cameron, um, he's the Head of uh, Strategic Partnerships for Tilium. Um, he's uh, one of the partners that we use for data enrichment and infrastructure. Uh, that works very closely with DVI. And um, Brad Lees, he's the Chief Data and Innovation Officer for Havas uh, Group uh, worldwide. I think both of you are based in New York, so thank you for coming down to Miami. I'm sure it wasn't a big uh, effort uh, to change a little bit the scenery. Um, so I think uh, before we start with the questions, just to set a little bit the context of what the panel is gonna talk about. In the morning, uh, Jared told us about uh, security data security, and uh, that's important because uh, I think companies have to start thinking about how to change the culture on how to manage data, and it goes beyond just talent, it goes beyond technology, it's a mindset of how we use data and how we protect that data for, for in, in our case, from for our clients and the advertisers. Uh, then Jeffrey talked to us about customer centricity and uh, use the example of Amazon, of how Amazon's basis of the business is understanding what the customer needs are, and that's the axle for their success. Um, so that's a very good segue into the panel and on Meaningful Brands. Um, as some of you know, Meaningful Brands is, uh, is part of an initiative that the group started over 10 years ago, uh, and it's been evolving over time. And uh, the video that Maria was explaining shows two very I guess, key statistics. One is that, you know, if uh, almost 80% of the brands disappear tomorrow, customers wouldn't care. So how do you create that link between brands and consumers that make brands more relevant and more meaningful to consumers? And then the second uh, statistic is that almost 60% of the content out there is irrelevant to consumers, you know? And that's a good segue because uh, I think data can really help us understand what are the drivers of creating content and understanding those consumer drivers. You know? And if you recall at the end of the, of the video, it said what, are, what is the purpose of content or what is the role of content for consumers? Uh, it could be educate, inform, inspire, reward, you know, give information and so on. So understanding what what your brand's role of content is to consumers in that regard is extremely important, you know, because we're dedicating a lot of resources, we're analyzing a lot of data, but are we really turning that data into meaningful data, okay? So that's probably the first question to the panel is for each of you, you know, meaningful is a very, you know, I think it resonates well with everybody in a personal level or uh, a professional level. So what is meaningful data for you? Maybe Ernesto. Yeah, you sure. Start. Um, thank you for hosting us here. Um, uh, one, yes, data is is very important, and uh, one of the things that we uh, try to work on is making sure that we gather the uh, the data that talks to us and allows us to go ahead and uh, create that content and connect to the consumers. Um, and one of the big things that we have been uh, discussing about is personalization. If you personalize, you obviously connect better with the consumer. The problem with uh, personalization is that you require the, uh, uh, you need to build the right content to connect, to uh, personalize. But before personalizing that content, you need the data. And one of the big uh, problems that we're having with data is uh, we're gathering data that is probably incomplete. So we're not rounding up 
the, uh, the data that is required to build the content to really personalize whatever we're uh, trying to provide to the consumer. Um, so yes, we are in the process of, of trying to connect uh, and uh, build the right, the, the right content out of the right data, uh, but we're failing to bring in the right data to kick that process uh, into great content and obviously to make it meaningful for consumers and obviously personalizing and connecting and make it meaningful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Travis. Yeah, so. Um, just on the topic of meaningfulness, and I think it's always been backed by data, right? And I think if we look back um, versus where we are today, it was always done by surveys and qualitative research groups and quantitative surveying that was sent out by mail. I think in today's society, we were able to collect a lot of that from our websites, our applications, call centers, um, that data that we as consumers are exposing, right? So I think when we're looking at how we analyze it and how we create that meaningful brand, what was maybe you know, a, a very outgoing or a purposeful approach of how you were surveying before, the questions that you were asking, the type of people that you were bringing in, now we're trying to do it more en masse, right? We're trying to customize it even more down to a person. And I think when you're trying to do that um, more en masse and down to a, a exact person level, it's about understanding the data that that person's exposing to you. Um, I fundamentally believe many businesses are turning to be more experience-based in their models. And with becoming more experience-based, they need to better understand that customer, right? And I think experience and meaningfulness go very closely together of, um, if you create a meaningful experience for me, I am then going to be uh, more dedicated towards your brand. So something that we do and that we help over 900 clients with is understanding who that consumer is, connecting those different data points that they're exposing to us, because that, for all of us in this room, that is, you know, our most valuable piece is the data we expose to brands, brands that need to interpret it, understand it, and create that personalized experience and that content for us. So um, I, I think kind of where the industry is going and where we should all be focusing as marketers and as data practitioners is better understanding who that consumer is, better being able to tie them across devices or experiences that we've already created, and then being able to analyze it afterwards to say, what is the population size that I need to hit to create content for that group to then turn them from a normal consumer into an evangelist? Right. I yeah. think it's a perfect uh, segue, Brett, because you are all about meaningful experiences and meaningful yeah. data. Yeah. So. so at Havas Media, we, um, we deliver on this meaningful brands idea that, mm -hmm. that Vivendi has by talking about and delivering on uh, media, meaningful media. And meaningful media is trusted, infl influential, and engaging to, to a human. Um, and we call, uh, you know, what we do at the end of the day, delivering a media experience, right? So we, we, we're, we're the part of the business that puts the ad in front of the audience. We don't do the creative side, but we've got a side that does that. Um, and so, you know, w when we think about what data we need to understand what, what media experiences or what media is meaningful to people, um, there's a lot of data out there, right? Especially with all the digital data. But um, a lot of that data is anonymous, right? So a TV panel, um, in fact, well, Mexico had one that was breached, right? Um, but th th you won't get I the identities of those people, right? But you will get identities of the people that, you know, um, whether you know, it's a, a cookie drop or a device ID. So w we live in this, this ID world with a lot of identity data, with all this behavioral data. And we live in a non-ID world, right? And which, and they're both still really useful. Although surveys, you know, have gotten bad name because they are what people say they do or say they think, and then we have all this data of what they actually do. So w the the task is is to combine these two different types of data into um, into into a frame that you need to make a decision, right? One of the things I think a lot of people skip is, okay, data to action, data to action. Well, what's the decision? And so, um, you know. <laughs> to try and bring it home from a, so a practical example is think about TV viewing, right? And data that we have um, from set-top boxes here in the U.S. Now that, that's ID level data, um, but there's also non-ID data as well from the TV panel that you need to trade on. And we've got this thing called the meaningful rating point. 
And what we're doing is instead of just looking at the reach, the, the TV ratings and, and maybe the percent of the, of the total audience of the TV program that is the target, we're actually adding a measurements of, a, of attention and loyalty, right? We're trying, to, we're trying to understand how meaningful is that TV programming? Is it, you know, it, do, they, do they consistently come back to that TV program every week, right? That, well, that must be, there's a signal of meaning. Um, and then if, if, if um, they're watching the TV programming all the way through, you know, they're, they're probably not on their phone. Maybe they're on their phone to check out content about the, t the show they're watching, but they are focused on that show. And so there's ways to understand meaningful media from data. I mean, it's still, you're still making some assumptions, but it, you, you actually have a lot of the data already there. You just need to combine ID data with non-ID data into a simple frame, into a decision frame that humans can understand. Okay, um, it seems that I mean, we all know that data can be a great asset to understand better how to communicate, how to activate, you know, how to deliver our message. But um, what do you think is the biggest struggle that companies are having to make that real? You know, the, you were talking, Travis, about the enrichment of data and getting to that personal ID or customer ID. Um, but from your perspective, for example, what do you think companies, your clients, are struggling with the most to make that a reality? Yeah, so I think one of the biggest things we see is just data collection issues, right? Of where they've had one company build the website, maybe a different department has built the application, they have a different team managing CRM solutions or call centers. Um, all of them are reporting or generating data, but none of that is equalized, right? Most organizations don't have a common taxonomy for what they're looking at from a consumer data set perspective. So our most um, evolved clients, I would say at this point, have gone through years of actually creating that common, ta common taxonomy so that data is util able to be utilized downstream. So they're pre-cleansing that data, they're making sure that it's named the same, they're gathering those similar IDs about a person so they can start to connect those experiences. So if you look back to Jeff's slide that he showed of consumer one, consumer two, consumer three, and you, it's, it's a disparate journey of how somebody goes through that, um, the, the better organizations are actually saying, let's name everything the same at every touch point in that experience so we can better unify and understand what that journey actually looks like. But it all starts with the data collection footprint and how you're looking at naming everything and correlating everything back together there. I actually have to agree. One, one of the biggest uh, issues that, that we have is collecting that data. If you think about, uh, if you think uh, of the uh, consumer journey and uh, if you uh, think about the last time that you bought a, a ticket, um, you bought the ticket online, maybe you bought it on the, on the app. Those are two different touch points. You, they go through and uh, uh, information is, is gathered maybe in a completely different place. Uh, then you uh, do the check-in. You might do it in one or the other, regardless of, of where you bought the, uh, the ticket. Then you walk through to um, uh, the airport and then there's the counter and or there's the uh, uh, the screen where you can do whatever you need to do there. Then there's the uh, on-flight uh, experience you have. And uh, all of those touch points gather information in completely different places. And uh, then along comes this cloud concept. And then uh, we're rushing into bringing on different uh, providers to teach us a little bit about how is it that we start gathering the information and uh, how do we make sense of it. And then you start realizing there's uh, 10 Ernestos mm -hmm. because I bought with different emails, I have different phones, I have different ways of connecting to or pushing data um, to be able to get my tickets, purchase, do any type of transaction that I want. So there's scattered data from operations, financial, transactions, behavior, all over the place. And we invest a ton of money communicating. And then we get different information. Where do we gather that? Is that uh, something the agency needs to do for us? Or are we integrating that somehow? So I completely agree. That's one of the biggest like issues that we're having right now.
uh, how do we make sense of it, and then how do, do we push it into that chain that I was talking about earlier. Now that we have it, we haven't figured it out, then we uh, create the content that makes sense, and then getting to a point where we uh, really have a conversation about personalizing that experience. Yeah, so we, we think that this uh, taxonomy um, is probably one of the most crucial elements uh, to solve for. Um, we also think that uh, ad tech and martech, ad advertising technologies like ad servers, <coughs> marketing, techno marketing technologies like uh, CRM, database marketing, those, things, those two things are coming together. And that means uh, data from both of those things are coming together. Um, and we're finding that there's the same data in multiple places, sometimes from different sources. So that means that <coughs> on the mar marketing technology side, on the client side, they may have age, gender, <coughs> um, you know, address. We may have the same thing, but it's not, you know, but it's different. And so you, in order to have a single view of the customer, you have to resolve that and you have to have a procedure to do that. <coughs> so taxonomy is actually probably one of the biggest areas to, to look into. Um, even after you do that, you still have to figure out you know, what decision you're going to make, and we honestly have problems with that. Um, and so a lot of people are bringing uh, a lot of you know, the, the decisions to the data, so they'll go, oh, I got a, I'm thinking in terms of media, I got a, a campaign, we're going to target these people. Hey, social people, hey, wh what can you tell us about these people? Uh, rather than the social people saying, okay, I see that you know, we've got a campaign, I see here's how you're going to maybe allocate across the, the different channels, different touch points. What data do you need to make that decision from social? So, so we really believe you've got to have a decision framework and know what data you need. And it's going to be pretty small. It's going to be human understandable. And it, you're going to make all that big data surrounding you small to make the decision. But you've got to have the taxonomy right, or else people are going to say, well, I, I have a different view of the, of the con consumer, and I call, you know, them something different, and it's the same data over here and there. You know, con data consolidation is 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 the only way that Martech and ad tech can work together. Thank you, and uh, Ernesto, going back to what you were saying, I mean, Latam is a very big company. The, you have a lot of touch points where you capture yeah. data from consumers. Same consumer is accessing different platforms, so you're trying to you know do matching on a customer ID level, um, but you're still struggling to activate that, you know, uh, like most companies are. Um, what do you think is the biggest barrier there? You know, because we're, we're is, it a, is it an internal talent issue? Is it a common technology issue? Is it a changing of the culture, like we were talking about earlier today? Yeah. What is really, what should really be the focus of companies knowing that, okay, tech, tech is important, data is important, we know we need to do it better, but what's really being the struggle? You know, there. That's um, th I think that's a very complex uh, question, and I do not think there's a, there's the right answer to it. I would love to go back to Juan's point on on culture. I do think that there's a there's a huge cu culture component. Um, I think uh, one of one of the things that I perceive from being in in a couple of companies is. Uh, we were not prepared for the wave of technology that just came through. We were just not there when we started feeling that. So uh, we, we were just reacting to what's happening. I do think um, we try uh, getting the best partners to help us out. and. Uh, companies should definitely start working on uh, the right talent or the right training. Um, and it is something cultural. I think there was a, uh, an interesting question. Uh, can, do you think the culture is something bottom up or top down? Uh, that's an interesting question. And um, I do think that most of the cultural aspects are top down. Uh, you do as you as you see, and then things cascade down. And um, the reflection of the company is very, very aligned to what is happening and the vision on top 
uh, that is driving that big steer, uh, uh, th that the person that is steering the, the company. So there are multiple things. There is a culture, uh, there is training, there are partners that we work with, uh, there, is, uh, there is the, the hiring component, um, and there is making sure that we understand, because one, one big problem about technology is that we are also afraid about technology. And uh, the one thing that we should be very certain about is our brand. And how is it that we want to make our brand our business, rather than making sure that we have the latest technology in place and the best cloud in place and the best data repositories in place? How is it that we really activate the brand in a way in which we put the things in place mm -hmm. that make the brand that business, rather than working ourselves and overworking ourselves with technology things? Yeah. But so it, it is a complex uh, answer. Because it is a complex uh, It's a uh, complex question, question. and it's, it's the problem that we're all facing really today, is trying to understand how to better interpret today, you know, the world today. Um, you mentioned something important, which is uh, the brand, you know, and uh, I think when we, when we think about data, we, on a, on a communication perspective, we always think about performance, you know, and the data is going to allow us to perform better. It's going to allow us to activate better, to connect better, we're going to become more efficient, um, but then we forget about sometimes, and we're in the agency world, we forget about the branding side of it, you know, that is ex also very important. And for that, you also need data, you know, and building, build, building a high performance brand requires you to understand that branding also yields on performance, and data does that. And uh, this is a question for you, Brett, on that tone. Um, you were talking about trying to understand. Uh, how to create meaningful rating points because that's a that's really changing the currency that we use and the, and the market uses not only here in the U.S. but worldwide. How, what do you think is the role of creating that you know new currency to link performance or data performance with branding performance? Yeah, so that's. Um, <sighs> We live in this attribution world, right, where Google gets a hell of a lot of credit for, you know, bringing it home, right, bringing it through the door. And, and that's fine. That's fair. They, they have a brilliant model. But there was a lot of things in the consumer's mind before they, they, they typed in that brand name or maybe the generic term and got to a brand, right? Though the idea of those things in, in the consumer's mind was usually put there by either a brand experience, so flying on, on one of your planes, <coughs> or by advertising, right? And they have these associations in their mind, and when they're faced, when the consumer is faced with the decision, whatever comes top to mind, they, there's a rational, ultimately a rational and somewhat emotional process. So the uh, long way of saying it's about uh, putting, thing, putting ideas in people's heads. I mean, that's the role of advertising and media, is to create associations between a brand and what the brand stands for. So at the point where <coughs> the consumer is ready to make a decision, it, you know, it's top of mind. And, and that sounds old school, but that's kind of the way people work, right? Because most of the time, they're you know, on their phone or they're you know, watching TV or at a cinema. They're not about to buy whatever you're trying to sell them. <laughs> the, the, it will come up at some point, but you're fa you, know, you have no idea how far away they are from making that decision. Now, of course, if you have digital tracking, you have a better idea, but something could happen in their life, right? So the expectation of the, the, the media has got to work right now, it always has to work right now, you know, is, is the wrong one. And we've seen actually uh, a lot of brands invest way too much in performance uh, media where it's just like pounding, you know, pounding, pounding, pounding. And you look at their brand trackers, which a lot of big companies uh, started cutting out during the recession. They're like, oh, we can't afford this brand tracking. We don't need it anyway because we have all this you know, consumer level, ID level tracking. Um, they're starting to realize that they, they didn't invest in the brand advertising that creates the associations that when the consumers at that moment of truth, when they got a decision about what they're going to you know, buy or look into, 
it's not top of mind, right? And, and who's ever invested in the brand is top of mind, and those brands are winning. So, all right, was that too long? No, no, it's <laughs> fine. It, it's, it's finding the equilibrium, you know, like everything yeah. in life, you have to find a balance. And uh, I think we went too much on one side of performance and left the side of branding, thinking that branding does not yield to performance. It's just, you know, short term versus long term. Well, how, to, how do you find yeah, that balance? The, the challenge is, though, you have a lot of empirical evidence that the short stuff works, right? It's proven. You invest in affiliate marketing or you invest in, you know, search or you invest in, you know, something else very performance oriented, immediate response, the CFO is going to like that a lot better. So you've got, you've got a different type of argument to, for branding, much more nuanced. There's a lot of evidence, a lot of research that backs this is the way people work, this is the way human memory works, but it's a different type of argument. Um, and I'll end with, I was meeting with a CFO trying to sell uh, him some, some marketing mix models, this was like over a decade ago. And of course, I had the, the proverbial like, oh, and here's the you know return on the investment in the models. And he said, um, if I added up all the ROIs from all these, you know, whether it's you or you know the Mark Tech people or the Ad Tech people, my company would be in a totally different place, right? So we've got to have a recognition that you know th it is it, everybody does contribute to this process. Everybody does want credit when it has successful. <laughs> when it's not, you you see people run. So. Let's just watch out on some of the claims, right? Hey, it's, you know, yeah, CRO, uh, conversion rate optimization does do it, but also the, the you know, the, the investment and the content in that website, right? In, into thinking about the people that are going to show up. What are they going to respond to? Like, everybody should get some credit in all of this, this process. It's not just, you know, one, the one thing. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's about meaningful. It's about creating meaningful brands. And, uh, um, we're not tech companies. I mean, um, Tilium is, uh, but Latam is not a tech company. Havas is not a tech company. And I, I, you know, in the last couple of years when I've talked to clients, I think part of the struggle is that we were not born as a tech company to handle the challenges that we have today. You know, Ernesto, you were saying, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a complex question because it's about culture. It's about how you were born or where you, were you born as a company. Um, and, and the biggest struggle that, that I think companies that were not born in the, as a tech company is, uh, is that we have to make continuous investment in technology. Because I think before we used to invest on something and it would, it, it would be okay for four or five years, it would be fine, it would still work. But nowadays it's, I don't know if monthly or weekly, but technology really is a very dynamic animal. So uh, this is a question for you, Travis. How, how does Tilium address technology? And uh, because you have a commercial aspect to sell to clients, to sell to partners that are between advertisers and the data publishers. I mean, how, how does Tilium address technology uh, within the culture of the company? Yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll frame that as like, what do we look at when we're building out our own technology stack, right? So as you said, we're obviously a technology company. We have technologists that are probably to build our own and to sell it. Um, but when we look at investment in our own stack and what we're purchasing, right, it has to be purposeful and tied back to a business objective, right? Is, it, is that to generate more sales? Is that to do better customer support? Um, is that to better monitor what's going on from a social listening perspective, right? So always tying back to a business objective, I think is of key importance at all times um, to have a team dedicated to manage that tool, right? So I think there's always the desire of, oh, there's the new shiny, technology that was just released or new company that just came out, I'm, I need to go buy it because I was told I need that new acronym, right? Um, without having a, a team dedicated that knows how to manage that or a partner that, know, that you can bring in to help manage it, you're not gonna get any effectiveness out of it, right? So you have to be purposeful again, tying back to the business objective, having a team to manage it, and then not having a set it and forget it attitude, right? Of, I need this team to manage it, I need the, the business objective that they're, they're driving against, and I need them to be in it on a regular basis to derive value out of it. So when we look at that process, it then comes down to who are the people that I need involved in it, right? And a lot of times you just say, okay, I'm gonna hire this person to manage my DSP, if you're, if you're maybe a media agency, right? Um, they actually need to be involved in a greater strategy because it's all about the customer that you're trying to acquire at that point, right? Uh, if you're running media, it should be part of the broader strategy of what are we actually trying to get that or change in that customer behavior or that consumer behavior, right? Are we trying to create a need? Are we trying to get that last piece of attribution or, or that to them to make purchase? 
what is that greater strategy? So I think it's about tying your technologies together and understanding it's not just what I'm doing within my email tool, it's not just what I'm doing within my CRM tool, but this is the objective that I have for that customer that all these tools are then working towards. Yes, you might have different people that operate that tool, but they should have the greater vision that you're trying to create with all the technology that you're purchasing. Thank you. Um, open it up to questions. Uh, I think we have a few minutes left, so. Um, I'm sure you guys saw uh, a couple of days ago uh, at the uh, WWTC, DC, uh, Tim Cook talked about um, this new practice of sign-in with Apple um, versus, you know, with Google or Facebook or some of the other um, apps that are out there. If there, do you expect massive take-up of this? And if there is massive take-up, does that send a message from the consumer standpoint that, you know, um, that they want to share less? They, they want personalized experiences, but um, they're not quite as interested in sharing as much um, uh, with you or as a brand uh, as, as we have been collecting in the past? Yeah, so I'll, I'll take that one first. So um, I, I think where we're moving to, so you have ITP 2.2 that's out now, right, which is deletion of cookies. You have GDPR, which is how you're managing data. You have CCPA of how you're able to sell and collect data in California, right? So there's all these global security regulations, and I think it ties in very well to the first talker or first speaker this morning of just how companies are collecting and treating data, right? I think what's happening is, as you've always had with some of the walled gardens, of Google has a logged in state, Facebook has a logged in state, now Apple has a logged in state. And we're moving to less of them because they are more secure, right? Apple already has, I have a, an iPhone, I have an iWatch, I have a Mac. Apple already knows everything about me, so if I'm securely logging into this new web property through my Apple ID, I feel secure because I'm secure in everything else that I have with them. Um, so I, I think people will m move that way, the same way that I'm logged into my Google Chrome account across every single device that I have as well. Um, but I think it, it's their move of, we're getting rid of cookies, which was kind of the traditional ad tech way of identifying people, now I'm moving to the Apple ID will be the new way of identifying people across device. And of me as Apple, then tying people together and you know, maybe they come out with their own uh, sell side platform sometime soon, but. Yeah, it's gonna be very hard to get to that minority report, you know, future of like perfect information on people, right? Like you walk into the gap and well, maybe the gap, I don't know if it'll exist anymore, but. Uh, <laughs> That, that's going to be super hard, and so what you, what you have to do is you have to have the right taxonomy, and, you, and for the different marketing and media decisions along the way, you've got to know how you're going to make them, and you bring the data to the decision. Uh, there's just sort of no other way, and the other thing is, is that you've got to get good at inductive reasoning. You've got to get good at telling stories with different pieces of data um, that aren't necessarily related. So back to your, yeah, uh, not only people, but companies are creating privacy, right? Private networks. And so from an agency and marketing perspective, you gotta get good at piecing it together and creating stories. Yeah, and uh, I, I, I completely agree. And I think, I think we're moving uh, down that path. We look at the Googles and the Apples and we see huge walls around those gardens. And then we think, oh, that's gonna be horrible. But as companies, we also need to think about how do we create a big wall around our garden. We have incredible amount of data, of first pa uh, party data. We have frequent flyer programs. We have an incredible amount of data of people that are traveling every single day, where they travel, how they travel, the seat that they like to travel, um, um, if they go or not uh, to, the, to the lounges we have. So we do have an incredible amount of data and we'd rather improve and enhance that data and make it valuable so we can have a better relationship and make it, make it a sound relationship rather than start um, leveraging on an, uh, data outside that might uh, create a lot of noise and uh, make it non-meaningful. 
Um, oh, how much how much is technology hindering the access of data for consumers? You know, with app blocks or you know, blocking cookies and things like that. And how much is it brands really not communicating the benefits to consumers of having access to that data? Uh, really, I mean, uh, because we're looking at data from. Uh, as, a, as a company, our own interest. How can we sell more? You know, how can we get more market share? But are we really communicating as brands the benefits of having their data uh, in our hands? You know, what it, w w which one is waiting more? Technology impeding capturing data or brands not communicating the benefits? What do you, what do you guys think? I, uh, I think there's, there is a huge opportunity in telling the consumer what is it that we can provide if uh, they share the, ri the right data with us. And if you share this amount of data, we will give you this amount of uh, either products or information back. And if you provide a little bit more information, then we might give you a little bit more back. Uh, but I do think that there's a, there's a huge misunderstanding. And the problem is the the short story behind, or the short story from the past. Uh, the companies have screwed up. Mm -hmm. So there is a lack of confidence, there's a lack of, of trust. Mm -hmm. um, so we need to get over that bump, we need to start working a lot better. Um, technology is just uh, creating a lot of noise around all the, this, this relationship that we're having with the consumer. Because there's apps and there's um, uh, phones and, and there's a lot of stuff. And the, the, the lingo is, I think, not understood by the common person that has a phone and, and does a lot of uh, transactions uh, day in, day out. Uh, but it's on us, brands, to make sure that we have that communication, tell them exactly what they will get out of this relationship. Yeah, so I have a, a slide that I love to present all the time, and it's data is the egg that sits between uh, customer expectations, then you know, brand goals and regulations and safety compliance piece, and it gets squished in between, right, where um, consumers might not want to provide data because they don't know what I'm going to personalize to them, and then brands can't personalize things because the, the consumer is not providing data, right? So I think technology is very much needed to enable that, that experience, and to especially if you want to do it in real time. Um, but I don't think we as consumers have a good idea of what personalization actually means. So uh, we obviously look at a lot of studies. So 22% of consumers actually believe they get personalized messaging, uh, whereas probably we as brands 100% want to say, we personalize everything to you, right? Or when we're doing media, things like that. 56% um, of consumers will provide more data so that they receive personalized messaging and 68% when they want personalized offers, right? So there's, there's huge gaps between the customer expectation and then what they believe reality is. And I think it's largely driven off of the technology that we wear because we think, oh, you know, if I can do this with a phone, then why can't a brand understand everything about me by me just walking in, right? And I, I don't think that there's a, there's a good um, understanding of, of in consumers' minds of what that means or what we're able to do with the data that they're providing to us or the limited data that they provide to us today. So um, my opinion is like the brands that are doing it the best explain from the outset what you're going to get if you provide them data. And you see it largely within publishers of, We'll, we'll give you five free article views. After this, you need to log in to view more so that we can p personalize content to you so that we're able to send you emails based on what you view, things like that. So publishers, I think, are a little bit further ahead in it. Um, but I think it's, it's very much a consumer mindset and, and just understanding of what that truly means to them. Um, in Europe, the, um, you know, with GDPR, how many of you guys been to Europe and got online? And you see uh, immediately, like right in front of the content that you, you, know, you try and go to CNN, like whatever, just some whole thing takes over and says all the small text. Some, some brands do it better than others. But about 50 to 70% on average uh, uh, are just immediately giving their consent, right? So 
if, you, if there's something behind that consent, even if they don't necessarily think they personalize it, although you said you would use that information to personalize it, people will give their consent to great media experiences, whether that's a brand media experience uh, or you know, they're gonna complete a transaction or they wanna watch a video. People do, right? But it's, it's gotta have some reward, as, as Maria talked about, right, into some sort of meaningful part of their life. It's either a functional meaning or a personal meaning or a, a collective meaning that they'll give consent to. So if there's meaning <coughs> behind that, they will give consent. I, the other thing I'd say on personalization, I worry about all the complexity and the costs that that engenders to do sort of true you know, personalization. I think uh, a lot of brands are struggling with that. <coughs> Dynamic content optimization from, for media has been around a long time. It's not that big of a business. It should have been a bigger business. By now, if it really, if the returns are really there, because I, I think there's, there's, there's two things. All of that complexity, <coughs> agencies then, can, they just suffer. They just go, ah, sorry, we prom over promised. <coughs> and there's also something on a human level about um, uh, everybody in, in a country or in a market having the same idea of an ad, right? You know, did you see the ad last night? Or, do, you know, it's the same way they talk about the content from, from TV programming. There is something about mass media that works. Yeah, it's inefficient if you really think, oh, only you know, this subset of all those people watching the program are, you know, are gonna respond, but they do talk about it, right? It's a shared experience. So I think, I think we're gonna see, um, with the collapse of ad tech and martech, I think we will see more personalization because the taxonomies are gonna get tighter. Uh, you, you'll have ways to say, well, here's a personalized ad if we only have a quarter of the information we really won't need, so on and so forth. But I think you're gonna see a shift back to, it's okay to do mass media because putting that idea in front of, and in the minds of a lot of people actually works. And it's okay that it, not everybody bought the product, right? It, that, that whole dilemma of you know, which half of your advertising works, I'm not sure it's the right dilemma. As long as your company's still in business, of yeah. course. <laughs> Well, thank you. I think Juan is uh, signaling me that we're running out of time. Uh, I think we have a coffee break now. Okay, so maybe in the coffee break, if there are some questions that you you, you, you want to ask these guys, take advantage of that. So thank you so much for your time, for participation. Very interesting. Thank you.